So there's a couple things to start with here. First of all, we're scared to death because all of you guys have seen the movie and know the graphic novel. So um, we don't get a chance to do this a lot. We love what we do, and this movie is something that we spent a lot of time on. Um, it represents pretty much everything that you can do with sound in movies and music in movies and everything from the most subtle to the most extravagant sound work. Um, we're really... We're extremely grateful to Zack Snyder and his family for allowing us to work with him. This is the third movie we've done with him, and we sort of get turned loose to do the best that we can possibly turn out. Um, we have a great crew. Scott Hecker is our supervising sound editor and sound designer. My partner, Frankie Montano, is our sound effects mixer. My partner for many years, and Tyler Bates, our composer. Um, we want to thank Zach and everybody, the Warner Brothers Films, and especially the MPSC for getting this forum because we not only like to do what we do and love what we do for a living, but we like to talk about it when we get a chance and talk about some of the inside stuff that goes on with it. Um, so we appreciate you guys coming tonight. We really appreciate that we have such a sophisticated audience to play to, and we'll try not to bore you. But when we did our run-through earlier today, it was evident that what is um, in store for you over the evening is really cool. There's a whole variety of... Some of the stuff is sort of arcane, you know, run-of-the-mill stuff that you guys might know about. Uh, Tyler's got some tricks up his sleeve that we think are going to be really fun. Um, and we just want to thank all the support people, all the people that have made it here, the engineers, the uh, people like Eddie Badalik, Jeff Taylor, who's here. We wouldn't be anything without those guys. Kirsten, who books us, Andrea Wertheim, who's our post-supervisor and shepherds us through all these things. We love working with these people, and most of all, we love what we do. What the movie sets up here is that you're going off into a completely different reality, an alternative reality that only comes from the book and then Zack Snyder's mind. And Tyler's got some comments about music, and I think Scott's got a couple of notes about maybe the fight sequence we can start off on. Sure. T? Uh, I think what Chris is alluding to is the Bob Dylan song. Uh, he did license it to them for the film, and gave us the three track recording, the three tracks that it was recorded on. And uh, the interesting thing is, the, you know, Zach felt that the verses were repeating too much because they obviously looped the song. It's about three and a half minutes originally. And uh, Dylan wouldn't re record it, but he said, have at it, do what you will. And um, so our recording, score recording engineer and mixer, Gustavo Borner, who's here. Uh, hosted a meeting over at his studio with Zach and, and Wes and, and a bunch of us, and we were discussing this and what we were going to do. And we were really going over an arrangement for the song because what we were asked to do was to create insert pieces of music so that we didn't have to continue to repeat all the same harmonica lines and all the, the vocal, you know, the verses uh, verbatim. So uh, it was pretty com complicated because Zach was determining which verses should be where and which ones he wants to keep and which ones he's willing to repeat. And then, uh, then we mocked up an arrangement for them and then they just randomly did their picture cuts to it. And, you know, Dylan was not playing to a click track to begin with. So um, <laughs> Nick, who works with Gus, uh, charted the whole thing out. And then in between the sections that we were keeping of the Bob Dylan, there had to be a click track that was created, and we brought in a couple of musicians who uh, really were fantastic at emulating that style. And of course, Gus did some research on how the original tracks were done. So it is quite a long sequence. However, about 35% of it is new material. And in some places, it was sweetened just to make it a little bit broader in scope. But uh, I thought it was, it came out pretty well, considering we just completely, you know, bastardized the Bob Dylan songs. So. <laughs> <laughs> Which no one's been allowed to do, so it's, it was kind of a first. It's great to be able to pull it off. Scotty? No doubt. Um, we were really excited, this being our third film to work with Zach. And um, when we first saw, I mean, obviously, the graphic novel is super colorful. And uh, when we first started seeing uh, initial footage of the film to work on, we were just so blown out about, you know, just how colorful and vibrant and how true to the graphic novel it was. And excited, you know, at the prospects of all the different opportunities sound-wise. And we made a list of, you know, different adjectives and things to keep in mind uh, while, you know, uh, dealing with all the sound. And it was like kaleidoscopic sound or sound, you know, like a peacock. and 
and uh, we just really wanted to make it flavorful and colorful so uh, we could be true to the, the style of the film and all the images that you see. And one of the biggest things, as you just saw, one of the four fight scenes. Um, and so it's a it was a huge challenge for us to try to keep those interesting because, as you know, um, you, you know, there's not a huge variety in fist punches and crashes and things. But we did go out of our way to uh, try to tonalize and pitch and, and, and keep all the different uh, elements interesting, not only in the different food groups of types of punches and crashes, but also in each fight we sort of stylize, try to stylize um, the elements in slightly different ways. Even though the fights are separated in space between the different reels, uh, even if you, you know, cut them all together, I think you'd find it pretty interesting of the variation and variety in the, in the effects. So. Uh, we're not going to focus much more on the fight scenes because that one is uh, the uh, first one and most impressive as far as just setting the tone for what we did, but um, that was one of our big challenges. We will play some gratuitous stuff later on, but for the most part, <laughs> one of the cool things about the movie is that it, uh, it has all sorts of different levels that it operates on, and there's dramatic voiceover, there's um, some really heavy dramatic scenes within the movie itself, and... Um, so it's, it's too long to play everything, and you guys have seen it, which is fortunate for us in our discussion, but um, we picked a couple of scenes we thought were sort of iconic, and we're all kind of acolytes of Zack Snyder's, and we think that the next sequence we wanted to show you is what we call the tenement fire. Um, it's one of the first, like, breakout moments in the movie, and um, I think Tyler said it best this afternoon we were looking at it, and said it, it has all of the trademarks of what Zach does so well in movie making, but you can't always play sound at the same speed that action is. I mean, uh, just to paraphrase you, what you're saying as far as the score goes in this, and we're going to break it down for you a little bit and show you um, some of the sound effects on it. We'll play the sequence by itself. It's about three minutes long, and then uh, Scott and Frankie are going to talk about some of the different, as we call them, food groups within sound effects, and then we're going to break out into music in just a we won't drill down too far with it. But it's a really cool sequence because um, everything isn't operating at the same speed as you think it should be. It's kind of a, it's a balancing act as far as music goes and sound effects, and it's not just playing to the action that you see there. So there's some, some cool stuff. So this is our tenement fire, as we call it.
Is that Jesus? <laughs> no, baby. In this particular clip, uh, one of the two things we wanted to point out is um, and talk about is the owl ship itself. And uh, it's always difficult because in most films when you have spaceships, the obvious go-to is jet sounds and it's pretty hard to do without those sounds. Um, but again, we did try to keep those interesting. But basically it was broken down to general jet sounds, jetty sounds, and uh, the, another flavor uh, that we sweeten everything with is a myriad of different wines. And uh, then even still, as interesting as we had it, we thought, you know, this being Watchmen and trying to keep to our, our creed of uh, keeping it flavorful and colorful and whatnot, we wanted to add some real tonality and color to the uh, owl ship. And uh, we, you know, just called through our, our library listening to interesting um, synthetic tones and whatnot. We came up with a really uh, cool complex, um, uh, sort of a, a mid-range complex synth tone that um, basically we uh, processed and pitched in uh, it with an Eventide plug-in and then routed and mapped, uh, mapped it to uh, the Command 8 fader to actually perform the uh, pitching up and down with the various moves. Uh, to get the sound, and it gives it a sort of an orb sound, the really warm, uh, low frequency sound that obviously is embellished and, and uh, panned and made incredibly beautiful by Frankie's uh, skills. But uh, I thought Frankie could, uh, you know, break down those, f those food groups for you so you can just break down uh, the different elements. Are we ready? <laughs> um, are we taking a picture on screen or Pick. film? To we're going to take a picture from the, yeah. Right, so uh, what we're <coughs> first going to play is um, the takeoff. So it starts off with the various wines. Um, the idea of obviously pre-dubbing is to get everything in shape and manageable for final. Um, with that said, we also want to make sure there's enough separation uh, to listen to what music's doing, what Ty's doing, and how we're sonically rubbing so we can manipulate the sound effects or vice versa to work in key uh, with, with music. So we're, you know, we, we hit and miss and we want to make sure that we're, we clear music changes and things of that nature. But uh, what we'll hear now is uh, the pre-dubs in, in full glory. We'll start here. So the first thing we're going to hear is uh, the blast. Looks like it's online. <laughs> So, so with that el element, um, it's panned, and we used a little spatial verb on it just to, as it came and went, buried in all the other things. But, you know, we try to detail as much of the material as we can and uh, get it in the, in the right placement, in the right space. So the next thing we'll play for you is uh, the next component, which is, uh, again, a jet uh, complement to go with that. The third compliment. It's got the pitch shifting. That's the synth tone. And the last one is the lone component. It's all said and done. And that 
that's what uh, made the uh, owl ship what it is. Nice. And an another part of interesting part. <laughs> The other thing, because this scene was so uh, loud, I mean, it was loud, but that was the, the biggest challenge all of us were challenged with is trying to create an ebb and flow so that, you know, it wasn't a bombardment at any one moment, was creating a space for that explosion. And as you could see, um, we worked really hard on sucking in all the sounds, leaving a beat of silence right before the, uh, the big explosion. And uh, Frank, you, you can... We should go down and take a look. So what we, you, you saw it as a whole piece. Uh, what we like to play for you is because we pre-mixed and, uh, <clears throat> and by the time we got to final was, was months apart. So uh, what we find visually, new goodies and per request. So we'd like to play for you what we had originally and then we'd like to play you how we, the sweeteners that were added to it. And uh, I'd like to show you that now. Let me just add one thing to this. One, one thing that happens a lot on the final mix is that um, we see things as elements come together. The tie score is doing something. Um, a lot of times music and effects are going through, are playing straight through sequences without a break. And you see things and you say, well, here's a, this is, there's two things in this sequence that are amazing to me. One is this amazing chick, super chick <laughs> coming through the roof and landing. It's like the, one of the greatest shots in the whole movie. And the other is this moment where she's in huge peril. And I think Ty had originally written music to go through and scored the event, and Scott and the guys had written sound effects to carry the continuity, everybody feeling that you need to carry the energy up. And in reality, what you want to just get is this brief moment of like, holy shit, what's about to happen? So against everybody's wishes, what we try is just say, what if you just stopped everything for a second? So this is a good great case of where no sound is better than as much sound as you could possibly have. So there's all sorts of pre-dubs that were done and music was written and um, it's kind of hard to hack it at the last moment, but it comes up where somebody might say, what if you just didn't have anything happen there for a minute and that that beat would give you the chance to play the fireball and play the peril that much more and it, it would complement the silence that comes afterwards. So what happened here is that it's nothing in the pre-dubs or in the score was prepared to do this, but it came up that way. And a lot of times it takes being very selfless on the sound designer's point of view or the composer's or the picture editor's point of view of just saying, what if we tried this and it's not really what anybody set out to do at the beginning, but that's the good part about collaborating. We've all been lucky to work together on a number of films together and nobody will ever stand up and just say, you know what, the hell with you guys, I don't want to do that. I wrote it this way or tried it that way. So um, collaboration is great. Um, this is a good example of something that just came up on a whim one day when we walked in after having mixed the scene and said, let's just try something completely different so the yeah. fireball all of a sudden has a lot more impact. Hey, we are friends, Chris. <laughs> so I think it might be interesting if you reprise that very famous film music quote that you mentioned earlier. <laughs> <laughs> um, our friend Michael Kamen is no longer with us. In a bit of agony one night said on the scoring stage, he said, film is where music goes to die. <laughs> and <laughs> and, and Thank you very Tyler much. made me say that tonight because I meant it, said it to him earlier today. So this sequence is where film music went to die because it used to exist, but it doesn't anymore. However, the movie's well, better for it. <laughs> you, <laughs> you know, Scott has a glorious moment with the owl ship. <laughs> and for every glorious second of the owl ship, it's just the music is just... <laughs> and you just, you know, fortunately, we're, we're really tight. and We've been through a lot with all the temp dubs and everything that, that we've been through. So I think that that sort of you know, sensitivity or ownership is like out the window. I mean, we're all just looking for the best moment possible. And it's really kind of cool to get to that point, especially doing what I do, because, you know, some people can get all up in their own business a little bit too much about music, you know. But I think it's cool when you really see someone else's work that's fantastic and you're part of it and you're all working together in a scene. And I think that's what we strive for. It's not about one aspect of the sonic uh, assault, you know, winning the battle the whole way through. It's really about, you know, creating the best possible ex experience or the best possible sequence that we can. So it is really quite cool to do this. And for that, I don't mind when they cut me up a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> he does, but he just doesn't say it. We have to buy him lunch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but also uh, in Ty's defense, the, there's a lot of music that's in the movie for a long time before Tyler gets to put his music in. And there's more than one time going through temp dubs where I've just watched them standing over here on the side saying, you know, guys, I've written music for this. And 
the filmmakers are saying, you know, we want to play it safe. We need to get the film through preview. We need to get the studio to buy in, and we need to get, in order to get extra days or money, whatever it is, we want to be safe. So, you know, when you have a big investment up on the screen, people are very conservative, unlike what most people, I think a lot of you guys understand this, but a lot of our friends don't understand that we work in an extremely conservative business as far as stuff like that goes. So for Tyler to get as much film music into this movie, original music into a movie like this, and not have people be saying, you know, use this and try this, or we're resistant to doing it, is a tribute to him, and the, the landscape of the music is just amazing on it. But we do hack it once in a while, and one thing we do is we just say, you know, you can't offend each other. You, it's okay to hack the music once in a while or try something very rough. And maybe the execution isn't the best, but the idea behind it is what you're trying to get to. And I think that's what happens here. Um, we're talking about a four-frame hole. It's a lot of talking for <laughs> nothing. Yeah, but but I, really... <laughs> by the way, we're, we're missing one of us tonight. Uh, our music editor, Daryl, is, is very sick, so he couldn't be with us. But he is the gatekeeper of the score over here, and he really is collaborative with the guys over here. And... Honestly, there's never any animosity. Chris is alluding to the fact that, you know, I'm privately brooding, but I'm really not. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's all good, you know. We're all kind of looking out for the best interest of what's going on, and, and everybody here is just so into music and stuff. I never feel slighted yeah. by it. So um, it is cool. We're, we're sorry that Daryl can't be here, so I will try and uh, sort of speak a little bit on his behalf at some point through this, but back to the point. He's going to play blues guitar later on, so this is all bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's um, talk about the sound effects. Yeah, having pre-dubbed this uh, initially, and then we didn't final it for about a month and a half afterwards. You guys mixed another film in between the two events, and in that time, the visual effects matured quite a bit. And uh, so Frankie's going to show sure. what we pre-dubbed and then show you what we added. What the original intent? Original intent. What is flown in? This is the is this stem? This is additional. So that had a larger, more distinct suck in, and then together. So a lot of times you don't see the ramping of speed and time that Zach does until you get farther along into the, the process. So you're preparing for one thing and all of a sudden you'll see something else. And that's one thing he does really well is um, in fight sequences and ac action sequences, does this playing with time where you can go down to something that, you know, should take a second. He can make take five or six or seven seconds and um, we get to respond to those a lot of times late in the game. So that's where that came from. And I think you want to do a demonstration of music on this as well? Yeah, so, so we can hear it, sure. <laughs> <laughs> He's not bitter. <laughs> no, the trade-off goes both ways. At the end of 300, it's like we heard this piece of music that Ty scored for the end. It was just the most beautiful piece of music that any of us had heard. We were all drooling. And we just said, just drop everything. We, you know, there's arrows flying and spears impaling soldiers and whatnot. So it goes both ways. You know, you know I am just playing, seriously. <laughs> Um, well, actually, you know, Zach's scores are pretty complex because he likes everything and um, we always have to be very creative and I don't do this by my lonesome. There are at least, I think, eight or ten people here who work in some capacity with me to help make this happen. I mean, we did, there's 85 minutes of score, another 20 for the Black Freighter and then doing the Dylan tune and... Like on 300, we started doing an animatic initially from a comic book. I mean, and then we did a test shot. So well, there's so many things that are involved in the progression of doing one of these films that it really is a compilation of a lot of people's talent and selflessness. But uh, um, especially Wolfie, who's here. He's helped me out for a long, long time, and it's been fantastic. But uh, so on in, in this sequence, you know, we start off with uh, just this... We have some synths here. Some 
percussion. Zach really likes guitar, so I had to throw in some Metallica. <laughs> it's more like Rob Zombie. And then, of course, the orchestra. Let's get to them. Part of it. And then here's about uh, 60 of our friends. Um, <laughs> let's see if I can put them up here. There we go. There's this always there's always this concurrent ethereal thread throughout all of Zach's films. I think one of the greatest challenges is for all of us is he's slow motion, he's you know uh, real time, he's in ramp speed, and then there's always a headspace with a character. You know, it's never just a voyeuristic moment in his films. You know, you really have to get inside the head of the featured character and at practically every scene. So that often is accompanied with, with uh, narration. So some of the most active, violent moments are very quiet and there's narrative in, in front of it. And so in some way you have to have this dichotomy in the music to definitely support the action that's on screen, whatever speed it's taking place, and then support the narration. And that's a, that's a pretty tough trick. I think that is something that um, we've you know, collectively from all the tent dubs and the dubs and things that we've done over the years is getting a little bit better. It's, it's not easy to do. You know, you'd just like to rip it up, but even on a track like this, you know, I wanted to, it's kind of an 80s romp, you know, sort of, um, that's this movie, and Zach wanted it to be that way, but the music almost at times plays aside the scene instead of just scoring it literally, and it also an allows for the, the dialogue and the sound effects to ebb and flow and just kind of come in and out, and I think, uh, you know, it turned out pretty well. It's it's not that complex, but I, I really like how it, how it worked out. Anyway, so Daryl is responsible for cutting it up and shortening it. <laughs> it's your request. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the cool things that we did, um, and you'll see it in some of the later pieces as well, is that this character, Dr. Manhattan, that's in the movie, when we first saw it, it was just Billy Crudup with this insane CGI suit on it. We were wondering where the hell it was going. And it's just as the character developed and as we learned more and more about him, um, Eric Norris and Rick Ramadka at, under Scott's supervision. Jeremy, Jeremy yeah. And Jeremy, Jeremy Pearson. Jeremy Pearson. Um, they kind of scored this character, Dr. Manhattan, and they realized that as his as he changes and he goes, I'll, I'll let Scott elaborate on it, but there's two ways that we score and a lot of times we'll get into scenes and we listen to stuff and Tyler will say, well, is that, is that my stuff that's playing there? And Scott will say, no, that's something that we did in the background. <laughs> so we do a lot of sound design these days on stuff that isn't really, it sounds musical, but it's not from the score and then we try to figure out how to fit them together or we try to get copies of Tyler's music in advance and the sound design guys write stuff around that that might complement it as well. But one of the things that was cool and uh, we wanted to showcase a long time ago when we were doing the movie was that there's this very subtle thing that happens in the movie and what you're gonna hear is gonna be a different mix of it but it's as Dr. Manhattan's moods change, the sound effects guys did this whole score for him. So he's got this whole characteristic musical element to him that plays very subliminally in the, mu in the movie, has to play under score, it has to play under dialogue. And a lot of the dialogue from Dr. Manhattan is very soft spoken, even though he's 80 feet tall in some places. Um, right. uh, so Scott's gonna give us just a quick bird's eye view of what that's about. Um, well, Dr. Manhattan, his character being created from uh, a nuclear accident, we were trying to figure out, you know, how we could articulate uh, the sound of his being and his existence um, through the visual effects. You can sort of see like energy coursing through his body, his blue body, and uh, and at first, obviously, you think, okay, it was a nuclear accident. Maybe we should go with uh, some electronic sounds or electric sounds and en energetic sounds. And I just thought it, that would be a bit boring. And uh, 
then uh, Bill Hoy, the picture editor, suggested that we experiment with some Tuvan uh, throat singers, some monks that, that are, have some really very beautiful and cool singing. Uh, but we found that it was sort of monochromatic in, a, in tone, very low tone um, for the most part. And um, so we sort of steered clear of that. It start, started sounding a, a lot like didgeridoo and whatnot. Um, then we started playing with some water phone samples. Uh, and that was interesting, but we had talked and we said a lot of people, you know, use water tone stuff. And then I was just thinking emotion. We have to sell emotion. This guy is so conflicted. He's like this man trapped in an omnipotent and omniscient, you know, presence. And so um, I was just thinking we have to sell the emotion, even though he comes off as a flatline um, deity, uh, I wanted to come up with some interesting sounds that had an ebb and flow and sort of articulated uh, his different moods and nothing better than whale sounds. Um, I think all of us have heard how beautiful they are and, and how they ebb and flow and they go up in pitch and they go down in pitch and there's multi-chorusing elements um, in their natural sounds and so um, predominantly with Rick and Jeremy Pearson, uh, we worked a lot with those samples and just based on the different uh, scenes uh, that Dr. Manhattan was in, um, we manipulated pitching and slowing and bending the sounds to, uh, to, to match whatever mood he was experiencing. And we picked three short clips. Um, the first one uh, is him actually being aroused and you can actually hear these sounds escalating and then all of a sudden when he's busted, it's like, hmm, you'll notice uh, a little. <laughs> but now these sounds are, this is not from the mix. These are just raw elements, um, just with a, a dirty guide track um, from the picture editing crew. And uh, Rick Ramadka is uh, one of the sound designers that helped uh, uh, develop the sound. And he's going to show you the, uh, the first piece. And I believe it's the arousal sounds. All right. We're going to run it all the way through, and then we'll break it down. So. And we're just going to run a, uh, you'll see pictures up here, just a kind of a cheesy quick time file, just so we can see more what's going on with the Pro Tools. Right. We don't have great picture for these. <sighs> what time do you have to be at your interview? Don't worry. We've got plenty of time. John, stop! What are you doing? Please don't be upset. I... I always thought you liked this. No. I don't... No. So that's what Dr. Manhattan sounds. Aroused and then disappointed. <laughs> um, <laughs> the next clip is uh, exhibiting his uh, sounds of anger. Uh, he's being uh, harassed by all these reporters. Um, as they talk about him possibly contributing to some of the people in his life uh, getting cancer from, from this nuclear uh, experiment. And uh, so now Rick's going to play those clips there. Jenny, I wasn't told. I stuck by you after the accident. I gave you everything. This is how you repay me? Jenny, I wasn't told I didn't know. Damn you, John. God damn you. Jenny, wait. That's it. This is Get up there. Get up there. Get those cameras off. Hey, back off. Everybody, back off. I need some help up here. Leave them all. Please. If everyone would just go away. And leave me alone. You can't call it. So as you notice at the end, it got really intense, deep pitched and flangy just to, you know, to exemplify the uh, discord in that scene. And then last is a scene on Mars um, where he expresses feelings of wonderment, um, realizing that 
uh, Lori was born of uh, the comedian and her mother, and he, he being such a despicable character that it's actually a miracle that out of that union um, she came. Events with astronomical odds of occurring, like oxygen turning into gold. I've longed to witness such an event, and yet I neglect that in human coupling. Millions upon millions of cells compete to create life for generation after generation until finally your mother loves a man, Edward Blake, the comedian, the man she has every reason to hate and out of that contradiction against unfathomable odds, it's you. Only you that emerged to distill so specific a form from all that chaos. It's like turning air into gold. A miracle. And so, I was wrong. Now dry your eyes. And let's go home. So that's sort of a, a little example of the range of his emotions. And we thought it'd be cool to just play those sounds so low. They're really subliminal. And I don't even know if many people really picked up on it when they're watching the film. But we thought if nothing else, it just would be a cool sound. People, even if they didn't know it was his emotions, they like just have this really cool soundscape. Uh, being on Mars and everything, so. Yeah, there's also, but there's backgrounds, there's music, there's all sorts of other stuff, I and mean, when you watch the film, when you see one of the last sequences, you, you kind of catch on to it. If you tune into it, you catch on to it. So it's a lot of work that goes into this very, very subtle amount of, um, like, airplay in the movie. So um, you never know where stuff's going to end up playing, but uh, it's pretty rewarding to watch what the guys do with that. Um, the next sequence we're going to do is the music, the Head of Real Nine, right? Sure. We've got a couple of fun things to do here. So um, as we get towards the end of the movie, um, we wanted to demonstrate what the sequence looks like with just the original dialogue track and then talk about what Ty did with music on it. So Cool. And, you know, with that last sequence, when, you know, because we do, we, we do spend a lot of time here on temp dubs and everything just because these movies are, tend to be rather complex, so we are all discussing it just so we can all learn each other's perspective really well and learn more about the film, because there's always something that you're not seeing, I think, at least the first few times around. And it's great, because Scott and I will talk about this, and when I know he's going to live in a certain range, when he has a, a motif like that he's going to apply throughout the film, I already know that I want to do the absolute best I can to stay out of that register, if, we, if at all possible, so that it can speak as clearly as as possible. However, you know, there are moments where they feature music and then, you know, we have music. But uh, it's not that we just <coughs> show up and we just clash and, you know, it doesn't quite work that way. We really try and yeah, have yeah. some sort of a symmetry between us as we develop each of our, the score and the soundscape of the film. And so um, that's kind of the collaborative nature of that we we have which is not always the case in films you know so it's quite cool um and it's really fun because it inspires music all the time scott always comes up with great stuff great ambiences and it's good fun good stuff i think you said earlier that you won that sequence though right only the second half <laughs> <laughs> okay cool okay so here's um we're not going to spend a lot of time on dialogue um, sound design is great, music is great, dialogue is just, you know, there's some wonderful aspects. Rorschach's voiceover is an incredible character in the movie. Um, we spent a great deal of time on it, and that was all Jackie Earl Haley's performance. There's nothing you can do, or you can just try not to screw it up because he's so good at it. But dialogue is, you know, usually just trying to clean things up and keep things as um, clear as possible, make sure it sounds good, it complements the characters, and it's intimate and warm when they are, et cetera, et cetera. And um, this sequence that we're about to see is um, where Adrian has trying to explain what his madness is all about. And 
the purpose of it is to show you what it was like with just music, so what was shot on location um, with no embellishment, no sound effects, no backgrounds, whatever, and then we're going to get into some really cool music things that Ty did with it. So, so yeah, just dialogue right off. This yeah. is just dialogue by itself right off. Eddie, we queued up okay? Attack. Millions of lives were suddenly ended in an act of evil perpetrated by Dr. Manhattan himself. Since the attacks, I have been in constant contact with the Premier of the USSR. Putting aside our past differences, we have both pledged to unite against this common enemy. With the rest of the world, we will prevail. This is a day we shall never forget. And yet we go forward to defend the human race and all that is good and just in our world. Thank you. God bless us all. Do you see? Two superpowers retreating from war. I've saved the Earth from hell. We both have. This is as much your victory as it is mine. Now we can return. Do what we were meant to. We were meant to exact justice. Everyone's gonna know what you've done. Well then, by exposing me, you would sacrifice the peace so many died for today. Peace based on a lie. But peace, nonetheless. He's right. Exposing Hadrian would only doom the world to nuclear destruction again. No. We can't do this. On Mars. You taught me the value of life. All right, Chris implored me to bring this uh, <laughs> unicorn with strings in. Uh, this is something I, I play a lot. It's a signature sound that uh, I used on 300. It's called a guitar viol. And oftentimes, um, before I get into perhaps the more uh, intellectual or technical aspects of creating a piece of score, I just want to transcend the emotion of the moment. And this is a very complex scene. There's a complete unfurling of uh, so much in this story, and yet these people are bound, and some of them are innocent but guilty by association. So it becomes pretty, pretty complex. And so I think the most important aspect of it is the welling emotion that builds. And um, basically, we're, we're in a post-apocalyptic moment that in theory, is not all that bad because uh, you know the the event was created by Ozzy Mendes to uh, basically initiate world peace, and um, that's by creating a catastrophic moment so that people will unite um, behind that in fear of a greater threat. You know, so I was thinking, okay, post-apocalyptic, you know, something like that, and uh, let's see. So I was, uh, So something like that it felt like the right range for the dialogue, you know, and the headspace. That's going to come back to us. I'm in a loop mode right now, but here's one of the themes that we hear throughout the film. very sticky. And the string line, this is something that kind of is recurring through the film. So, 
you can kind of just get into this headspace and just this world and without really being so literal about what your point is, you can just let it kind of come out and then I just step on the pedal if I don't like it and just keep going, you know. And then once I feel like I have something, like a real soulful emotional beat on, on uh, expressing an idea, then I will get a little bit more workmanlike about it and a little bit more intellectual, if you will, about fleshing it out. But it just gives you an idea, you know. I mean, we all have a very deep passion for what we do and I think that we look at this not only technically but from a very soulful place you know I think um, that that's part of Zach's movies and I think it's concurrent with everyone who's who's contributing to them so that's part of the process you know it's just a slightly unorthodox way of, of approaching it but uh, the actual piece of music then is uh, laid in and it really expresses I think the the reveal of Ozymandias' plan to everyone and this is something we've alluded to earlier in the story but haven't quite revealed and there's also a, a common space that Dan and Lori share and so there's that I alluded to a piano theme that we hear in there and that's kind of you know concurrent with them throughout the film and then uh, there's always an undulating element and that's sort of leading towards this really tragic moment. And I try and not look so much from the periphery as much as trying to get, my, get inside of the head of the characters, especially when you are thinking of something that's that devastating, that tragic, that, you know, the end of someone's life, you know, which we're about to see in the scene. So um, I feel like I want to be very cautious about how melodic and how overstated we become with uh, music in that way. But I just think about more pulsing elements and just sort of the welling of emotion, you know. So that's what I was trying to trying to do. We'll see. We'll see what you think. <laughs> Hit it out of the park. It's amazing the amount of talent that we have in movie making. To watch Tyler to play something like that to me, I've seen it three times today like that. And you could do it all day long and you, if that was the only element that played with that scene, you could make it work. But if you watch how it plays and it's subverted to the storytelling and to what goes on like that, then it's like, I'd love to just listen to that all day long. So my hat's off to all these guys, the sound designers and to the composers who do the stuff. <laughs> it's the best gig in the world to be able to sit and do this with people, especially on a movie like this that has so many varied aspects to it and that you can bring rock and roll sensibility to one and really high intellectuals and just play dumb luck to other ones, you know, and then you get this kind of stuff on top of it. It's just like, it's such a rewarding gig to have. So I love watching Tyler Bates do that kind of stuff. So thank you, Tyler. Thanks, man. So that, that, uh, that concludes the AV portion of it. And uh, I think we want to turn it over to our hosts and okay, see if there's now, any. Now, somewhat like a rock band, uh, I will actually introduce the players now that you're familiar with them. Uh, supervising the sound editor, Scott Hecker. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. Sound effects design editor, Rick Ramadakan. Uh, Ramadakan. <laughs> Close. <laughs> I practice this a lot. I'm sorry. Uh, on effects re recording, Frankie Montano. <laughs> Dialogue and music re recording, Chris Jenkins. <laughs> and your composer, Tyler Bates. Yeah. 